Welcome to another audio-only episode of the Zen Water Cooler Podcast. I am your host, Zen Water Cooler, and let's jump into today's episode, which is running your own website, the pros and the cons. This is a very big question, and I've got a lot of points to make today, but I want to get to a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, First of all, a big thank you to the people who left feedback on the first episode that's audio only, trying something new here, and some of the feedback was really positive. Uh, Norway Nicole says, have always listened to your videos while making dinner and doing housework, and nice to know you'll be producing content that I won't be needing to make mental notes to go back and watch at some point in time. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I rarely get, another person says, Sarah Ainsworth says, this is such a great idea. I rarely get time to sit and watch things. Mostly my phone is propped up while doing the housework. So that's perfect. This was exactly the intention was that you could do things around the house. You could wash your car. You can go for a walk. I do a lot of listening while I go for walks. And so I found this sort of thing helpful. Not that I'm listening to my own podcast, but you know what I mean? I'm listening to other people's podcasts. All right. So in today's episode, I'm going to be talking here about running your own website, the pros and the cons. I really want to encourage you to think of running your own website and selling print on demand as a business. And what I mean by that is it's a little bit different than a hobby like Redbubble or Merch by Amazon or TeePublic or Display or, or Zazzle, what, whatever the print on demand platform, running your own website is a completely different ballgame. It's checkers versus chess. It's completely different. So what I'd like you to do is the next time you're at the mall, just walk around the mall for a couple minutes and just look at the different businesses that are there. You might see a nail salon. You might see a restaurant. You might see a grocery store. And you need to ask yourself, how much capital investment was needed in these businesses? Now, most of us think in terms of staff or the actual building, the brick and mortar store, but there's other capital investment as well, right? They have to purchase inventory. They have to train their staff. There's time invested. So, you know, they probably signed a lease, long-term investments. So it's that sort of mindset that we need to have when we're looking at getting our own website and selling print on demand through the website. Now, you might think right away, well, hold on. There is no inventory and there is no staff. And I don't need to sign a long-term lease. It's kind of true, but it's also kind of not true. And so I'm going to get into those examples a little bit more later on here. We're kind of going to tie it back to actual businesses. And we can take a look at the similarities therein. Now, I want to throw out a little bit of credentials here. And I hope this doesn't come across as humble brag. But I feel somewhat qualified to talk about this, uh, A, because I've ran business websites in the past, and especially print-on-demand business websites, and I still do. I sell online. I've got a couple websites set up. I try very hard to not talk about myself in the videos because really I want to focus on either technical walkthroughs or simple concepts for print-on-demand. But I will say I do have a business background. I did go to university, and I have a business degree from an accredited university. So Back in my younger days, I did open up an actual brick and mortar store. It was actually a comic book store and it was a ton of fun. I learned a lot as well. And since then, I've also had what they call mobile businesses as well. So I had like, for example, a DJ business that I opened up and ran for a few years. And I've also had lawn care businesses and they've been quite successful. I've had a few rental properties in my time. So I feel qualified to talk about the idea of a business in general, in addition to print on demand. Look, I'm not saying I'm Elon Musk. I'm not saying I'm Bill Gates. I'm not saying I'm the world's greatest venture capitalist. But there's some similarities across all businesses that I think we can find are valuable. So typically, if you're going to open up your own print on demand website, some capital investment is going to be needed. I get this question a lot from people on YouTube or through my email or through Facebook. They say, look, I don't have any artistic skill. I've only got a phone and I don't have any time because I've got three children and I work two jobs, but I'd really like to make $100,000 a year on print on demand. Can you tell me how to do it? And it's like, well, but if I could tell you how to do that, I would have 20 of those and I'd be sitting on the beach sipping a Mai Tai because I'd be netting $2 million a year. So it's like, well, I'm not gonna tell you how to do that because there is no answer to that question. The real answer 
to any business, whether it's a print-on-demand website or whether it's running a restaurant, doesn't matter, is that you need to fill an actual demand in the world. You need to provide some value. So a lot of the most successful businesses in the world is it really starts with a, with a person sitting in a restaurant going, huh, they don't serve this type of food. And I can't seem to find that anywhere. I'm going to open up my own restaurant. Or they're walking around a mall and they're saying, man, I just can't seem to find whatever product. So they fill the demand themselves. You know, an example that comes to mind, I'm a big comic book guy. I'm a big action figure guy. That's one of my hobbies outside of print on demand. And there's a guy, his name's Todd McFarlane. And if you recognize the name, he's a really famous comic book artist. He's drawn Spider-Man in the past, and he drew, uh, he's drawn Spawn over the years, which is a very big uh, independent comic book character. And he's created a really successful line of action figures. And when he's interviewed, he basically says, look, I want to create the action figures that I never got. I want to create action figures for fans, for stuff that are made by fans for fans. He's, he's satisfying a need. So I really want you to put on that cap, that thinking cap, as we drive into this podcast today, because we're filling an actual demand. It's hard in print-on-demand. It's difficult because there's very few barriers to entry. Now, that's wonderful when you're first starting out. You say, hey, I don't really need a ton of capital investment. I don't really need a PhD in, you know, whatever degree you've got. You can just fire up a website, and you can just list a bunch of products. You you certainly can, but you have to ask yourself, why are people going to buy from you instead of somewhere else? There's more established stores out there. There's huge marketplaces like Etsy, Redbubble. Why would somebody go to your website and purchase from you? Are you selling something unique? Are you selling designs that other people aren't selling? You need to ask these questions before you decide to invest a few thousand dollars in a website and a graphics design software package and a laptop. And and we're also talking about the time setup too, right? I mean, there's time and energy involved. So typically what I do when I'm looking at any new business opportunity is I do what they call a SWOT analysis. And that's S-W-O-T. And it stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. So I think of those four things. You think of what's the strength of the business? What is the unique brand that you would bring to the business? I don't mean a brand like a Nike or a McDonald's. I don't mean a name brand, but I mean you. You're unique. There's only one you. So what is the strength in that business that would be inherent to you? And then you need to have a good, honest conversation with yourself and ask yourself, what are the weaknesses in the business? What are the risks What are the opportunities? These are all questions that you want to sit down and have a coffee with yourself and say, okay, let's list these out. Typically what I do is I get a piece of paper out. I'm old school. I get an actual piece of paper like a caveman and I get a a pencil and I divide the paper into four quadrants and I list S, strengths, W, weaknesses, O, opportunities, and T, threats, and I list them all out. And if there's too many T's, for example, if there's too many threats, then I might step down and say, that's this is not worth doing. But if there's a whole lot of strengths, boy, it might be really worth doing a deep dive on and seeing if it's worth coming up with a business plan. Okay, so let's talk about the nuts and the bolts here of setting up your own website. First, things you want, first thing you want to do is take a look at a domain name. So just as an example, you can go to a site called namecheap.com, and I'm just using this as an example. There's a million billion websites out there that sell domain names, but this is just an example. If you go to namecheap.com, you can see prices of what domain names are. You can typically get a domain name for under $100 for the first year. Sometimes first year is free. If you buy a package, often with a website hoster, you can get the domain for free. So you can buy just a domain name. It's not super expensive because it comes to like less than $10 a month. And, you know, this would be like the www.mystore.com. Now, a lot of the times the www's disappeared now. We don't really use that anymore online. So you would just think in terms of like, okay, Jenny's t-shirts.com, you know, uh, you know, Harry's apparel.com, whatever it is, right? So that's the website name that you would want to buy. I would typically recommend that you go with a .com website. You want to have something that's easy to understand, and you don't want to have something that's really long and convoluted. 
something that you know globally people can easily see. And then the next thing you want to think about is getting a printing supplier. So this is different. This is a completely different mindset than selling on Redbubble or TeePublic, for example, because they're the printing supplier. They're printing their own shirts and they're sending them off. They're just using your design. So you're an artist. You're sitting there getting a commission on Redbubble or Merch by Amazon or TeePublic, for example. But if you're selling on your own website, you need to somehow print the shirt. Now, I'm not suggesting you spend the next six years in your garage sniffing paint fumes, trying to screen, you know, silk screen your own t-shirt. I'm not talking about that at all. What I mean is you want to find a print-on-demand supplier, and a print-on-demand supplier would be something like a Printful or This New or Gelato. Those are three examples that I would just encourage you to Google and find out a bit more. Now, I have videos on both Crafty Stacks and Zen Water Cooler about these three companies. So Printful, I've used in the past, and they've got some really nice apparel. And this new is based out of China. So if you're looking for price, this new's quality is Chinese, so the price is really good, but there's a lot of polyester. It's not a lot of organic cotton, for example. So the prices are reflective of the quality of the product. And Gelato, I've been using recently, and I really like it. They've got an organic cotton t-shirt that's fantastic. And they've also got a lot of higher-end products as well. Printful has a lot of higher-end products as well. We're talking American Apparel, Fruit of the Loom, that kind of thing. So if you're selling on your own website, you'd want to ask yourself what products you're going to sell in addition to what designs are you going to upload. Those are the two main things from an opportunities perspective or a strengths perspective that you would want to take a look at. The difference, by the way, between strengths and opportunities, you might think, well, those are kind of the same thing. They're both positives, but strengths are what's internal to you. So for example, if I was using me as an example, I have pretty good graphic design skills, and I think like I have a pretty good sense of humor. So that would be my internal strengths. The opportunities, on the, on the other hand, would be external. So I'd be looking at the market and saying, is there an opportunity for a certain type of design, regardless of my individual strengths on it. Like there might be an opportunity for, you know, political designs in a certain niche. And I look at it and go, eh, but that's not really my strength. I don't have a huge interest in it. I'm not super well versed in it. I don't really want to take the time to learn. Eh, maybe that's a pass for me. So I really want you to check out these printing suppliers, you know, Printful, This New, Gelato, and really take a look at their costs and their products. And I would even encourage you to order a sample, you know, if you're so inclined. And what you could do is buy yourself a birthday present or design a t-shirt for a friend or a family member for their birthday and just get it shipped to your house. I really, really don't want to gloss over this point. I highly encourage you to do this if you're seriously thinking about setting up your own website and selling print on demand. This is the equivalent of you wanting to open up your own restaurant and walking into a competitor's restaurant, sitting down and having a meal, which every entrepreneur does. If you're thinking of selling to customers, then you need to be a customer at least once. Buy a few products, wear the products, and it gives you an understanding of not only how the product looks, but the shipping time, what it looks like when it arrives, what's the process of ordering online. These are all very important pieces that you would want to be knowledgeable in when you're running your own website. So the first thing was the domain name. The second thing is the printing supplier. Let's go into the actual pros and the cons. The pros of running your own website. It's a there's a huge pros. There's huge pros and there's huge cons. This is kind of like, you know, if you're selling on Redbubble, the pros and the cons are like good. But if you're selling on your own website, the, the pros are huge and the cons are huge as well. So the pros are that you can't get banned. That's the biggest pro there is. Like if I stop talking right now, it's totally worth it the time, the energy, the money, the investment, just because you can't get banned, if you're going to do this for like 10 years, if this is your like retirement plan, and I'm not suggesting you're going to make a million dollars, but if you're saying, look, I'm going to retire someday, and this is going to be my part-time business for the rest of my life, well then, this is a huge upside. You could work for years on Redbubble and then eventually get banned. You can work on Display or Merch by Amazon and you can eventually get banned. T Public is super annoying for this. People have horror stories online where they've worked for a year or two on T Public. They've uploaded a thousand or two thousand designs, and then inexplicably, T Public sends you an email and says, "Sorry, we've deleted your account." And it's like, "What? Why? 
I've been uploading public domain designs. Maybe I used a weird keyword. Okay, you can throw all that out if you're selling on your own website. You own your own domain name. There is nobody to cancel you. You're the canceller now. You're not the cancelee. Okay, you're the owner. So it's like, imagine if you owned a hockey team or if you, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I always go to hockey, but imagine if you owned a baseball team or imagine if you owned a football team. You're not getting fired. You're the owner, right? Nobody, you're at the top of the food chain. So it's the same thing if you're selling in print on demand, right? You can't get canceled. Now you could get a nasty email from your print on demand supplier saying, hey, we're not going to print this. So that's a you know, conversation you'd want to have with your print on demand supplier. And I've got real life evidence of this. Uh, I've tried this with Printful, for example. Let's use this as a real life example. So on Printful, on their website, you can upload designs into an image library. And then from that image library, you can take those pictures or assets or designs and you can make t-shirts from them. So I wanted to see if they would flag something. So I uploaded a Batman cover, a comic book cover, and I didn't modify it at all. I'm not pretending that this was in any way not trademarked infringing. My whole point was I wanted to see what they would do. So I uploaded it onto the website, onto, into my image library, and within two days, I got an email from Printful, an automatic email that said, hey, we flagged this image in your image library as being trademarked and we've removed it. Please do not upload it again. We will not print it. That was it. Now, if you were uploading swastikas and, you know, horrible hate content or something, then maybe they'd have a different conversation with you. They'd say, like, hey, man, like, you stop doing this to the website. Uh, and it's not like anyone can see your image library, but, you know, maybe they're causing the robots to get stressed out or something. I don't know. But at the end of the day, Printful has just decided they're not going to print certain things. They're not going to print Mickey Mouse, Spider-Man, Batman, trademarked items. Okay, great. So I've never run into a situation at Printful or This New and Gelato where they have banned me. It's not, not, not even in the conversation. They've, in fact, they'll email me, salespeople will email me and say, hey, uh, you know, we'd really like to work with you. We've noticed you've you know, shipped a few designs over the last couple months or you know, you've had a, couple, a really good month of sales. We'd like to extend you know, discounts or we'd like to extend free shipping for clientele that meet a certain, th certain threshold. So these are like, they want to work with you. These are totally different conversations than Redbubble or Etsy banning people. Because you got to think here, if you're working with Gelato, for example, print-on-demand supplier, you're the customer. Gelato or Printful are selling it to you. They're not selling it to Becky in Wyoming. They're not selling it to Janet in Edinburgh. They're not, like, they're shipping it to them, but you're the one paying. Now, this is also a con, right? Is if you're selling on your own website, you're paying for the product as it gets printed. So this, is, this happens once in a while. It's kind of funny, but not really. It's like somebody worked really hard. They set up their own website. They set up all these designs. They've got 200 designs up on their website. And then somebody places an order for like 30 shirts. And it's like, uh-oh. Well, all of a sudden you're getting hit with a bill for like 600 US dollars. And it's like, holy, like this is scary stuff, right? Now you're making money because you made a sale, right? So maybe you sold the shirts for 900 US dollars, but it's a, it, you know, it's touch and go there for a couple of days, right? Because you're, you know, you're putting down $600 on a credit card or you're paying with PayPal. It's like that money's gone. And now you're hoping to get it back in a couple of days. So there is that stress factor, especially when you're first starting out. Anyway, a huge pro is that you can't get banned. Remember, you're the print on demand suppliers customer, not your customers. You're, you are the customer, which is a, an amazing feeling. The other big pro of a website is that you can build up loyal fans. You can build up loyal customers. You can offer discounts to them. The reason you can do this is because if you're selling on your own website, you have the customer's information. So when you make a sale, you've got their shipping address, you've got their full legal name, and you get their email address. Well, that's a big deal. Because you can use that email address now. You can email them coupons, for example. Or you can email them a happy birthday if they've given out their birthday to you. Or the, you, know, you, you can basically touch base with your customer. And you can say, hey, I value you. And by putting a reminder in their inbox, they'll often 
think of you and repurchase eventually. Now, of course, they can unsubscribe. That's, you know, you don't want to be spamming people and you certainly don't want to be reaching into somebody, like overreaching, you know, somebody's privacy. But having an email list can be a really huge advantage because you've now got a thousand, maybe even 10,000 real life people that have purchased your product. And I know selling on a website, you've got a huge amount of repeat clientele because you're now a trusted vendor, especially if they have a positive experience out of the gates. Another huge pro with selling on your own website is that the margins can be a lot bigger. So selling a t-shirt is a great example, right? If you sell a t-shirt on Tee Public, you're making $2 US. And if it's not on sale, you can make $4 US. Well, you can make often $8 US, $10 US. If you're selling apparel like a hoodie or a framed print, you can often make 10 or $15 US. So the margins can be bigger. Now look, starting out, you may want to drop your prices or you may want to offer coupons or discounts. But eventually, if you're selling unique products and you're a boutique store, people are willing to pay more for boutique items, for specialty items. And I don't want to sound stereotypical here, but I have found for me personally, so this is my personal opinion, is that women, if they buy women's apparel, generally speaking, they're willing to part with a few more dollars to get exactly what they want. I found on the whole, men want a t-shirt. They usually want the lowest quality t-shirt for the lowest quality price. Not, not, not all the time. I'm not trying to paint half the entire world's population with the same brush. But I will say that when I sell women's apparel, I find I get more questions about what type of fabric is it? How do you wash it? What's the stretchiness? What's the fit? Can you send extra pictures? And as a result, they're willing to pay more for exactly what they want versus just, I just want a t-shirt. Now this brings me to a con of selling on your own website is there's way, way more customer service time spent and energy spent. So customers typically will have lots of questions and customers will typically have lots of what I call tire kicking. And basically it's, you're gonna get four or five emails from somebody who appears to be you know, a lonely housewife in Midwestern United States emailing you incessantly about a t-shirt and then they don't wind up buying it. It's almost like they're getting a payoff doing online shopping by looking at the design and asking questions about it, but they're not actually ever gonna purchase it. And I'm not saying that like with a bunch of you know hate in my heart, I'm just saying, just be aware that this is going to happen, that if somebody reaches out with a question, you might get a five to one ratio of questions to purchase, which means if you're making like 10 sales a day, you're getting like 50, you, get, you could get up to 50 emails a day. So I've sold on websites in the past that have been really successful. Typically what I've done for full, full transparency is I've set up a website and then I've handed it off to a friend or a family member and I've said, you run the website. I'm gonna upload designs. I'm gonna just list stuff. And then you handle the customer service piece of it because they don't have the technical aptitude to upload designs, to create designs. And then we've just split the money. So it's been a very lucrative thing in my life because I've got friends and family members that are running these websites and, and you know, hey, they're taking half the profit and I'm taking half the profit. And it's been a lot of fun as well. But they'll come to me, you know, we're sitting there having dinner one night and they're going, man, it's just tons of questions and tire kickers. And there's people just asking question after question. And that can be a headache. Now, if, if you like people, it can be a, a, even a pro. You might say, wow, I love people. It is an opportunity in the sense that selling on your own website, you know, you have to ask yourself, why aren't people just going to Redbubble all the time and, and not going to a website? Why do they ever go to a website? And the answer might be, they don't want to have a nameless, faceless corporation selling them a shirt. They want a human interaction with a human person. So a lot of times you'll see on Etsy or you'll see on people's own websites, they'll often have an about us page. And I encourage you to click on that because you'll often see, hey, I'm a single mom, or hey, I'm a married couple, or hey, I'm a retired war veteran. And you go, wow, this is a real person selling real goods to real people. It's a human interaction. And that can be a really positive thing for customers. They want to buy from an actual person. Now, another huge downside, another huge con to selling on your own website is the at least the potential for returns or complaints. 
So you need to make a decision kind of early on how you're going to handle this. And look, we could have an entire podcast just about returns. I could talk for hours just about the headaches, about returns and about complaints. So you'll need to decide, do you want to offer returns or not? Now, there's nothing wrong with having a website that sells print-on-demand items and you don't offer returns. You do not offer returns. You just put it right on the website. If there's a problem with your order, if your order's defective, I will make it right. However, due to the sensitive nature of printing print-on-demand items and the unique nature of every print-on-demand item, we are, not sell- we are not selling on a returns basis. You can just list it on your website. Now, it, it's probably going to hurt your chances of making sales. And, and to be honest, like I'm okay with that. You know? So whenever I list online through a website, I don't offer returns. Or in very, very limited circumstances, on a case-by-case basis, might I take a return back. Because what happens is, you got to think, there's colors to apparel, there's sizes to apparel, and there's designs. Well, those three things are really picky, right? Imagine if you walk into a flea market or a clothing store. You know, you got to satisfy all three of those things in order to buy something. And that's the whole beauty of print-on-demand. Okay, I can pick an XL shirt or a small shirt. I can pick a mustard yellow shirt or a mint green shirt. And then there's the design. Okay, funny cat astronaut, or maybe I want ramen noodles, right? There's all sorts of different designs, different colors, and different sizes. So getting a return is basically a piece of garbage, unless you're going to wear it yourself. Because it's like, okay, now I've got a purple shirt with a cat astronaut on it, and it's a fabric that I wasn't really huge into, and you know, it was a low-end shirt, and it's like, well, what am I going to do with this thing? So you either price in returns, and what I mean is your margins are high enough that you can live with returns, or you just don't offer returns. But it is, a, it is a con, and it is an opportunity in a negative sense, I guess it's a threat, that this could hurt your business. And I don't have a clear answer because it would depend on your margins, it would depend on your customer base. What happens a lot of times is that if you do offer returns, a lot of times print-on-demand vendors will have other opportunities. So for example, you might be selling at the local mall at a flea market. And if you're doing that anyway, if you're crafting and you're selling print-on-demand, if you get the occasional return, you could just take the t-shirt to the flea market and just sell it at cost. Just get your money back, right? $15 shirt, you get the return back. And it's like, okay, now I'm stuck with this shirt listed at the mall for $15 at the next craft show. Somebody comes along and buys it for $12, you know, $15, $15. And you can at least get most or all of your money back. It's an idea. But it is a real headache, and it's not an easy thing to deal with. It's probably the biggest con to owning your own website and selling on your own website is the whole, you know, questions and returns and complaints piece of it. If you're not into this, then I would strongly recommend not spending the time and the energy and the money to do this for your own website. Another thing is complaints, right? People can complain to you Or worse, they can complain on social media about you. If they have a bad experience, where are they going to go to leave a review? Well, on Etsy, they can leave a review on your store. On you know Redbubble, they can get angry at Redbubble, or they can just send the you know send the return back. But if they're buying through your website, they can't really go anywhere. So there is Google reviews. You know, every business you know has the capacity of having Google reviews set up. There's another site called Trustpilot, and so what happens is people threaten business owners. They'll say, if I don't get what I want, I'll go to the media. I'll go to Google reviews. I'll leave you a crappy review. And they're trying to threaten you, you know, give me the return or, you know, give me the product that I wanted, even though they didn't order the correct size or whatever. And they're trying to strong arm you, right? So you need to decide, can you live with the occasional negative review? And it's like, yeah, I mean, if you can, then great. You know, for some of the things that I'm saying in this podcast, people are listening going, eh, that doesn't really bother me. But for other people, they might be listening going, I need to deal with customers? Okay, that's a hard stop. I'm out. I don't want to deal with that. Okay, great. I mean, like I said, there's lots of opportunity in the print-on-demand world. This is one opportunity and a big opportunity selling on your own website. But it does come with risks and it does come with an investment of time, energy, and money. Another huge pro of listing on your own website is that you have overhead, so you'd be paying for your own website, and you'd be paying for like a Shopify app, 
This is what we call shopping cart technology. So Shopify is the shopping cart. If you're wondering, if you've heard of Shopify before and you're wondering like, why are they, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world, you know, they're growing like crazy. It's because they basically sell an easy way for a regular person with no technical skills to have a shopping cart online. When I talk about buying your domain name, I'm not talking about being able to buy something on your domain name. You, you buy the domain name, but then you have to house something in the domain. So think of your domain name like a house. So, you know, Jenny's t-shirts.com is the house, but you have no furniture to put in the house yet. Shopify is the furniture. Shopify is the, uh, the idea that customers can now come into your house and buy stuff. So there's other sites as well in addition to Shopify. There's Equid, there's Big Cartel, there's all sorts of, you know, Wix is another one. There's all sorts of shopping cart technologies out there. Some of them are really easy to use, but they're expensive. And some of them are harder to use, more difficult to use. Maybe you might even need a coding background, but they're relatively inexpensive. So Shopify, for example, is kind of the gold standard because anybody with any sort of basic computer skill can use Shopify. You just, it's a template. You just enter a bunch of stuff in and it's shopping carts pop up and then they take the payment. So the customer can look at your design, simply click a shopping app, a shopping cart, and they can purchase something. So Shopify will take the payment, take your Visa payment, MasterCard payment, and process it. They take their 3% fee and then they just send you the rest of the money. So you can see how this starts to add up, right? You're paying for a domain name, then you're paying for Shopify, which is typically a monthly fee. And then, you know, whenever you take a payment, they're also taking, you know, slicing off 2%, 3%, 4%, whatever it is. So you need to build up what your prices are gonna be. This is why a lot of websites, if you don't do this properly, you're selling $45 t-shirts. And it's like, well, you're not really selling them. You're just listing them because nobody in their right mind is going to pay $45 for a t-shirt unless it's really specialty. You know, it's organic, you know, 100% weave, organically sourced, fair trade cotton that is environment, environmentally sustained. Like there's all sorts of ways you can sell it or you can try to spin it. But at the end of the day, there's certain people out there that are never going to pay $45 for a t-shirt, right? Especially when you can walk into Walmart, you can buy one for about $10, right? So you want to make sure that you're listing something that they can't buy in the Walmart store. Now you really only pay for your product when you make a sale, but remember that's another cost as well. So you're paying for your domain name, you're paying for the Shopify app. When the payment comes in, you're also sliced off another 3% and then you're actually paying for the product too. Because the product, you know, maybe you pay $12 for the t-shirt, but Jenny in Idaho is paying $20 for the t-shirt. Well, there's your $8 markup. So that $8 markup doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're selling 20 shirts a day, and I've got websites up that have sold 20 shirts in a day, well, that's like $160, $170 on a day. So it adds up, right? The idea with a website is that you're taking advantage of basically capital investment. You're investing one big lump sum into the name of the domain name. You're investing one yearly lump sum into Shopify. And then you're paying for product as it comes in and you're turning $10 into $20 repeatedly and you wanna do this enough times that it pays for your investment. So it's an investment. It's very similar to the mall example at the start of this show. When you walk into a mall, somebody has a nail salon. Okay, they had to buy all the nail gels and the acrylic nails and all of the chairs and the lighting and all of the chemicals and then the staff and the store and the lease. The list goes on and on. So they might be in $8,000, $10,000, $20,000 for an investment. But now people come in and drop $60, $100, $200, and they do this multiple times a day. So it becomes a literal money machine. The question is, can you make enough money to get back your original investment? And that's really the big question as we land this plane here on this podcast is, can you make enough money on a per day or a per week or a per month or a per year basis that you can make back your annual investment? So what I would recommend you do is put pen to paper or put keyboard onto your Word document and ask yourself, okay, how much is an actual website domain name gonna cost? 
Is it going to be $100 a year? Great. Throw down $100 a year. Now, how much is Shopify going to be? Okay, it's going to be $30 US per year. Okay, well, that's $360 per year. Bump it up to $400 just in case there's taxes or extra stuff. So you're talking now about $500 a year in investment. And then that's just the investment. Now you're going to invest your time, your energy. There's one huge positive as well as I talk about this is that you're, you have this overhead now, this $500 a month, uh, a year. So $500 a year is about $60 a month, $50 a month, $40 a month, right around in that range, right? So if you can live with losing $40 a month, then there's really no reason to not try it. You know, try it for a year. I mean, the worst case scenario is you do it for a year, you lose 500 bucks. So if you're living in the part of the world where $500 is not a huge make or break, then you just kind of need to be okay with the idea that you could lose $500 to try something new. It's no different than if you've got kids in hockey school or if you've got kids in dance class or little Johnny's playing soccer. Well, if you don't have a, a little Johnny, if you don't have a kid and you've got $500 kicking around and you're like, huh, I can go to the bar for three nights during Mardi Gras or I can set up a website for a year and try something new. Eh, maybe you want to try something new for a year, right? And if you can live with losing $500, and mentally you can throw the $500 away, then go for it. The other option as well is you can sign up with a friend. You could have coffee with a friend and you can say, look, $250 commitment each. Let's try it for a year. Let's split the profits or we split the loss and let's just see what happens. It could be a fun adventure for a year or two. You know, maybe you have a two-year plan and you can just see what happens, right? Now, one of the biggest cons that we haven't really talked about, and this is going to be a subject for a whole other different podcast, is traffic. How do you drive traffic to your store? Because you could set up this beautiful website with 100,000 listings and nobody's going to find it. And there's really, I'll just go over it really quickly here. There's really two main things you can do to mitigate this huge con, which is nobody's coming to your store and thus nobody's buying anything. What I would encourage you to do is go into Google and just type in the phrase, you know, funny t-shirt and just see what comes up. You're going to see Etsy listings come up. You're going to see Redbubble listings come up. Maybe some Amazon listings come up. And you have to ask yourself, how are they getting these listings to come up on Google? Because Google actually is free. It's free even for vendors to use. Now you can pay for advertising and that's the first tip that I've got is if you're a business, and you're finding that you're making some sales but you'd like some more, you can pay for advertising on Google. Now, look, I'm not a huge expert in this. I don't pay for advertising personally, but that is an option. So I just want to throw that out there. Often when you're on Google, you'll see ads that pop up in the search results right near the top, and it'll say it's an ad. They do disclaim it. But the other results that come up near the top of the page, those are organic traffic ads. And the reason that they're organic traffic is that a human being somewhere in the past has searched for an item and then clicked on that link. So it's basically taught the algorithm, the Google algorithm, this is a useful link for the search term. It's just matching it up. So if you were to search Ireland stickers, for example, and you get back a Redbubble result, and then you scroll down past it, and then you wind up going to bobsirelandstickers.com, well, if enough people click on that, then over time, Google's gonna go, huh, Bob's Ireland sticker store is actually the most useful link, not the Redbubble link. And it'll move up in the search results. Now, Bob could always pay for advertising, but even if he doesn't, if he creates a really good website with really useful content and really good tags in the website, so in other words, the text on the website is useful, then it'll move up in the search results. I think people kind of freak out with tags. They hear the word tags and they're like, I don't understand how SEO, which is search engine optimization works. And I'm really nervous about this. It's actually pretty easy. You basically create a website with some useful text on it. So words, and you know, so you write like English words, like stickers, Ireland stickers, United Kingdom. And that's why a lot of products have descriptions on their website. So you know, it doesn't just say, this organic cotton t-shirt is a great fit. It will say, celebrate Christmas with this funny Santa design featuring Kris Kringle holding a cat. Well, l listen to all those keywords in those phrases, right? Cat, Santa, funny, list goes on and on. So the more keywords you can put on a website, 
the more it's going to help Google's robots pick it up and go, oh, when somebody searches for Funny Santa, they're going to click on this website. It's going to move up in the algorithm. So there's two main things to mitigate the con of how are people going to find your website. One is to pay for advertising. You can pay for it on Google or Facebook. But the other way is through SEO, which is search engine optimization. And that's just basically teaching Google what's useful. And hopefully your website is useful because customers are finding it and they're making sales. Okay, well, we're right at the 40-minute mark here, so I'm going to pull the pin on this podcast. I really, really hope you found this valuable. I don't really care about the YouTube algorithm and I don't really care about the number of views. However, I will ask if you did find this useful, please do hit that like button. That does just sort of teach YouTube that this is sort of worth it. And again, I really appreciate your time more than anything. I hope you found this podcast full of useful information. Now, if you've If you're new and you're wondering who is this guy rambling on for 40 minutes about print on demand, I have two channels. One is called Zen Water Cooler, so I'd encourage you to subscribe to that channel. And the other channel is called Crafty Stacks, and that's S-T-A-X, Crafty Stacks. And that is a deep dive on graphic design. And there's also videos about selling digital designs on there. So hopefully you find those things useful as well. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Continue on with the housework. Good luck making that meal, and thanks again. Have a great day.